Okay. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode five of Day in the Life Cybersecurity. My name's Simon Linstead. I'm the host and founder of the InfoSec Live community, and it's an absolute pleasure to welcome my guest today, Mr. Alex Rhodes. Alex, please say hello and introduce yourself. Hey, uh, so I'm Alex Rhodes, uh, information system security engineer, cybersecurity researcher with Stevenson Technology Corporation. Um, yeah. That's about it. <laughs> so tell me, Alex, how long have you worked at Stevenson? Uh, since May of last year, 2021. Uh, and let's let's dive let's dive back. Um, let's talk about your journey in because a lot of the people watching this today will be interested to hear how you broke into the industry. And as we were saying before we started the recording today, it's really important for people to understand that there are more than the traditional routes in um, and also the fact that when you're pivoting from different careers whether it's the military financial services or healthcare, there are skills that are transferable and you should be taking those into account so let's dive back to alex leaving school what happened next uh, i joined the army uh, i was a russian linguist for about five years uh, decided to get out and quickly realized there's uh, not a lot of work for an out of work Russian linguist. People don't need the uh, the Russian skill set so much. Um, so I came back into the army, uh, did satellite communications, which it, it kind of mirrors cybersecurity. It's more of the IT side, uh, getting communications across. Uh, jumped from that into law enforcement. I was an army CID special agent, uh, did felony investigations. <clears throat> and so uh, along the way, I was able to get uh, some training in digital forensics. So that was really my first break into cybersecurity. And it was just because I was in law enforcement and I had an interest in computers and technology. Um, how long How long ago was that, Alex? So that was 2010. But every single investigation I did with digital forensics, it was for a law enforcement purpose. I mean, there was, I didn't really see it as you know, resume building and skill building for a career outside of the military. It was, I need this training because I need to go do a case or this might come up in the future. Um, I took an assignment, um, ended up being the uh, information system security manager, which got me security plus uh, MCSA server 12. And then uh, I eventually got CISSP uh, through that. But that also was in the military. So the first, uh, the first real cyber security job outside of the military uh, came about when I retired. Uh, ended up working as a subcontractor with Raytheon, uh, helping them get uh, the different systems. So they had audit logs that they had to send in and we had, to, we had to get all their systems aligned and make sure they're using the right technologies, they have the right uh, programs installed to forward logs and, and everything is good. So I was fortunate enough to be able to jump into that basically the day I retired from the army. But it was, you know, using the skill set I learned in the military. Um, you know, security is a, is a big thing in the military. You, you have your bases, you know, you have fences, you have gates, you have guards. You can think of this as network boundaries, uh, firewalls, packet inspections, people coming in and out of the gate. It's like a packet going into your network and you're, you're getting your security, you know, they're, they're, they're checking the cars, they're checking the people, uh, making sure that they're allowed in. Same thing with your that's network. The, that's a true, the a true security first. Checking the packets mindset. coming in, making sure. Say again? I said that's a true security first mindset. And if only more companies would adopt that approach with their security. Yeah. But, it, you know, I was able to take the, the security training I got from the mili military, understanding, you know, personal security, physical security, information security, operation security, cybersecurity is just another form of security. And so being able to take what I learned, uh, you know, through my adult life and apply it to a computer, which, you know, I've grown up with computers, I like messing around with them. It was, you know, I was able to make that jump. And um how was the transition? Is this a different world, isn't it, outside of the military? How was the transition for you from that to what we would call over here Civvy Street, I suppose? Yeah, so uh, I would say honestly that it was easier to, to make the jump into cybersecurity from the military than it was uh, leaving the military and not having that structure and the, that lifestyle that I'd been accustomed to for so long. Um, 
you know, you can, you can order people around and, and everybody wears their importance on their uniform somewhere. Everybody's important. I get that. But you are immediately know when you look at somebody, okay, I need to come to attention and salute them, or I need to stand at parade rest, or this is the proper greeting to, uh, to speak to this person outside of just, you know, being a polite human. But when you, when you go to the business world, you know, this, your manager comes around, a CEO, a vice president, do you stand at attention and salute them? Do you address them by their first name? Is it doctor? Is it professor? Is it mister? Is it missus? You know, what's what's the correct greeting? And, and sometimes the, other, the other thing, Alex, is if they come in in a t-shirt and jeans, you possibly don't know who they are either. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, you know, I, I don't know how many times my boss in the military would come in in civilian clothes, but it was very few i mean maybe if they were on leave and so you, you get used to a certain structure and it's just not there so for me breaking into cybersecurity was easier than breaking into civilian status <laughs> i bet there's there, like you said there are so many similarities and um, one of the things that's driven me to try and help veterans in the communities is twofold actually one is when i had my own firm i had two veterans work for me who's <laughs> work ethic attitude and all over everything was amazing so i know how much they brought from what they'd learned in their service in the military and from my really limited time in this industry i've seen all these people over here who work in cybersecurity saying that they're lacking critical thinking skills and then all i see over here is all of these people who leave in the military who've got critical thinking skills inbuilt from the few years they've had in the service so it's from an outside point of view, a little bit frustrating, I think, sometimes. Yeah, and, and it's not just, you know, people leaving the military or, or pivoting from that that field necessarily. Um, as you were saying earlier, you came from the finance industry. Yeah. There's a lot of regulations and security built into finance. You know, if you're running a bank, you need the people to trust you in order for them to deposit their money in your bank. If they don't trust you, you don't have a bank. Correct. Same thing with uh, investments. You know, if you don't impart some some form of trust into this person, they're not going to give you a large sum of money to invest on their behalf. Right. So there's, there's a lot of security that that's built into that uh, industry as well. So, you know, it's, you just have to look at where you're coming from and seeing what skills do you have that translate. And once you learn how to essentially, I would say, be a linguist and translate your old job into what you want to do, you know, that's probably one of the easiest ways or when you'll start making that break. I think it's it's the thing I see most people fall down on as well. Um, I fell down on it. I certainly didn't do that. I've realized over time where my skills are transferable rather than realizing that from the start, from trying to come in on a technical basis, because I'm, like we said earlier, I've always been fascinated by tech too, but I'm not a techie, Alex. It isn't my strong point. I like playing with it. I like breaking it. I just can't fix it. <laughs> so, so, you know, I've, yeah. I've, I've stumbled in and, and found that there's a kind of gap in the cybersecurity market for the skills that I've got. And ironically, you would have thought it would have been the governance, risk and compliance. I mean, I had governance, oversight and control functions in a regulated capacity for 10 years um, in a, as an investment business in the UK. There's a massive amount of correlation between that and security in general and the processes that most or sorry i shouldn't say that some unregulated businesses don't have it's the simple stuff that you have to have through regulation like a disaster recovery plan you know capital adequacy requirements and all these things that kind of everyone should have unless you're in that regulated environment you don't particularly potentially know about it but ironically that that isn't where i've ended up adding value which is good because it's the bit of the job i hated that the bit I've ended up adding value with is the soft skills and again you know help helping people yeah. with that and there's a lot of other people in different industries who are not technical who've got these skills who I think could be a benefit here as well yeah there, there's a lot I mean it doesn't have to be technical there's a lot of other jobs uh, sales so if you're really good at sales learning the the cybersecurity and the IT skills and, and technologies and being able to talk all of that to the people that you're trying to sell something to. I mean, that's very important. I, I don't know how many times I've even just going into a place like Best Buy, Micro Center, um, Fry's, something like that. You know, they start asking, can I help you? Like, well, I'm looking for this specific think... thing. You know, and so you're, you're just 
being able to speak that language to the person you're trying to sell rather than just sell a product because the boss wants you to. I think that would go along. I think there's a there's a there's a gap as well, Alex, because a lot of people are coming in looking at um, whether it's red team or blue team. There's there's a massive gap in the support roles as well that go alongside it, but equally in more of a generalist role. Um, and what I mean by that is where I've had some success is in a consultancy piece. And if you've got a little bit of knowledge about the whole framework and an understanding, but no, not a deep dive, there's the potential there you can add value because then you can help explain the technical from people who aren't very good at that to the CEOs and to the C-suite. So I wonder whether there's a way in for people not to have their own firms because you can't without the underlying knowledge, but to work alongside existing firms on relationship management. I think there's a kind of missing missing piece there. Yeah, I, I think that kind of goes back to what I was saying about essentially being a linguist. So you're you're learning how to speak multiple languages. You know, you can speak the, the tech language and talk to the technicians, the IT people, the cybersecurity folks. You can also speak the, the business piece and, and talk to management. And then from there, you have to start translating between the two. You know, if your cybersecurity professionals are saying you need to do, uh, you know, whatever, whatever, like log4j, you need to start patching log4j. And here's the reasons why. And they start talking technical. Management may not get that. But if you can explain, OK, here's the business case for this patch. If you don't do it, this is what could happen to your company. Yeah. Management all of a sudden understands why cybersecurity is, you know, a force multiplier. It's a, it's a big piece of this puzzle. Conversely, you know, if you understand the business side of it, management says we can't buy this new firewall because and they lay out a business reason. It's too much money or it's it doesn't yeah. doesn't work with what they're trying to do. Then you can translate that back to the the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the cybersecurity people. You know, management says we can't do this because. So here's the tech reason that you want. Here's the business reason that says it can or can't happen and. and you know, explain it in a, a language that everybody understands and the point gets across. That, do you know, Alex, I've never heard anyone say that before. And I've got to be honest, I've been a bit naive in all of my discussions with people where I've really focused on the other way conversation, you know, from the tech team to the C-suite. But now you've said that, it seems glaringly obvious how important that is. <laughs> and to get the buy-in of the people who are actually doing the work, doesn't it? I mean, you know, if you have kids, think about it this way. They come up and they start talking about the loads. <laughs> I, I, I have several myself. Yeah. One's on the way. Uh, you know, they start talking about the, the latest toy, the newest thing they want. Well, yeah. you control the pocketbook. If you don't think it's a good buy, if it's good for the family, if it's good for your kid, you're not going to spend the money on it. No. So it's, it's a two-way conversation. But again, it's, you know, you've used an analogy there, which in the business world is, is amazing because you've helped frame that and put it in perspective for people. And that's clearly why or one of the reasons you've been so successful, Alex. Um, we will get in trouble today if we don't do a big focus on an organisation that we're both involved with. I'm very proud to be an advisory board member for the whole Cyber Human Initiative. Um, you, you've got a specific role within that organization and they're really making some waves at the moment. And I think 2022 is going to be a massive year for them. So can I get you to talk a bit about what they're doing at the moment, Alex? Yes. So uh, I'm the Youth and Community Engagement Director for Whole Cyber Human Initiative. Um, co-worker of mine and somebody that I helped mentor and make his break from, uh, you know, he pivoted from the military into cybersecurity, uh, Paul Cummings. Uh, came up with this whole thing and it, it's based off of the fact that there's a lot of unfilled roles um, there's a lot of miscommunication which kind of goes back to our last conversation um, between the tech world and the business world uh, there's a lot of managers there's a lot of hr people hiring uh, managers that don't fully understand uh, the technology side so they see a certification, they see, you know, a master's degree, they see a bachelor's degree, they see various buzzwords in, in society and think this is what you need to succeed. And that's not always the case. Um, you know, I had a bachelor's of Russian when I retired and that's how I broke into cyber was with a, a degree in Russian language, not so who, who would have thought that? Yeah. So, you know, there's other ways in there's, there's ways to to use the skills that you have and 
there's a lot of free training. Uh, we're, we're actually trying to get uh, some donations and some money coming in to help <clears throat> pay for certifications for people if that's the way they need to go. But it, it's trying to reshape the landscape and, and make everybody understand there's not necessarily one pathway. Um, Security Plus is not the end all be all to get a, a job. You know, there's, there's more than just uh, red team, pen testing, uh, SOC analyst, as you were saying earlier. There, there's a myriad of jobs out there. Um, so taking a look at all the different facets of cybersecurity, IT, business, uh, the soft skills, so human resources and sales, getting, getting the tools to the people that need them, um, getting people hired. They all have a, a cyber flavor, if you will. Um, I know we've been using the, the color wheel. I forget who came up with that one, but there's the cyber color wheel. So, you know, red team, blue team, purple team, people have heard a lot about that, but there's a bunch of other colors on there that, that cover some of these positions we we're talking about. So, you know, kind of doing a deep dive into your, <clears throat> excuse me, into yourself and what you're interested in, um, learning the different roles. <clears throat> Maybe you think you want to be a pen tester, but after, after you've gone through some training, you realize, I like talking to people. I like, you know, learning about new tech and maybe selling. So maybe sales yeah. is the way to that's, go. That's, or, that's what happened to me, Alex. Um, 100%. Are there, am I right in thinking there's some opportunities for people to get involved uh, from a candidate perspective with the whole Cyberhuman Initiative at the moment? Uh, yes. So, you know, if you, if you can go to the website, um, it's really I'll put, it, I'll put that, it <laughs> should be coming up right now as we're saying this along the bottom. Yeah. So it's a really, really long uh, domain name, but you know. <laughs> we'll put it, we'll pop it in the comments as well. <laughs> but yeah, um, so uh, where is it on there? I think it's under the more, <clears throat> I have to look it up. Anyway, um, yeah, you can register and become a candidate. It's free for candidates. You get, a, um, <clears throat> there's a couple of, of forms that'll come your way, you fill these out you know so there's some questionnaires who are you what are you doing biographical information uh, what are you interested in and then there's some training that is free so you go through the training kind of opens your eyes up to the various uh, roles that are out there you get a chance to learn very specific things about say red team uh, SOC analyst uh, information or sorry incident response incident response IR um, you know things of that nature and learn you know, maybe what I thought I wanted to do is, is wrong and I need to do this. I'm more suited for that. Or maybe, no, uh, you know, being a pen tester is exactly what I need to do. That's where my skill set is. And so you get the broad training to expose you to everything and then kind of narrow down what you're looking to do. Um, there's some interviews, you know, we, we try and help people get comfortable talking, uh, learn how to how to talk the business language and, and do an interview. Um, we can set up for practice interviews. Uh, a lot of people are uncomfortable talking. I think, I think that really helps just the, the talking through the process. And also for those, especially who are either transitioning or have been in another job for a long time, they probably haven't had an interview for 10 years or maybe never had an interview. And um, knowing what's going to happen, managing those expectations is crucially important. But for me, the most amazing thing that they're doing is that journey of self-discovery that is so, so important. And it's back to, to something we were talking about yesterday, which is the amount of extortionate training providers and solutions <laughs> out there. We're not going to talk about that today because that's all I ever talk about, but it's a real issue. And for me, I made some mistakes. I luckily didn't fall under the path of one of these providers, but I've, I've sat and paid for OSCP when I was clearly nowhere near ready. And if I'd have just had the chance to join an organization who could provide me with a bit of that clarity and take me through that self-discovery journey, it would have saved me a lot of time. And, and at the moment, you see it day in, day out on social media, more and more people being sucked into these opportunities, not opportunities, these scams, sorry, schemes, uh, you know, and it's it's horrifying. And, I, and I'm trying to do my bit as well to put a stop to that and that's why I love working with the whole cyber human initiative so much and um, we can't spend the whole chat talking about them although Paul would be pleased sorry <laughs> Paul. but we do need to mention quickly that they have got a new clothing range so again I'll make sure that we put the link to that in the comments I want I want to go back because you you said something that piqued my interest earlier with regards to your history and and that was satellites mm -hmm. now 
For me, again, not being a techie, um, my understanding of the world is, especially having Starlink at home and kind of living off that in a remote location, we're very reliant upon satellite technology in general in life. The more I've learned about security and cybersecurity, the kind of whole threat thing for satellites is making me a little bit nervous. And I'd like <laughs> you to make me feel better about that, please, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can. Um, I've worked with satellites off and on for most of my career. Um, you know, being a linguist, there was a lot of uh, intelligence work dealing with satellites. Satellite communications, obviously, is satellites. Um, previous position I had after I retired from the Army <clears throat> was working with first the Air Force and then the U.S. Space Force as that came online, uh, protecting one of their satellite systems. So. I would like to say, yeah, everything's great. I don't know that it is. Um, it's a kind of a new frontier for a lot of people. Like you have, had mentioned, uh, a lot of people don't really think about it, but it's it's prevalent in everything we do. Uh, cell phones, internet, uh, all types of other communication, tele uh, television, you know, broadcast TV, sat satellite TV, cable. Um, in, in the US, uh, Sirius XM satellite radio gps you know there's just a, a myriad of ways that i mean the one the one that surprised me alex i mean we live in a very remote um sort of rural location surrounded by farmland mm -hmm. and we've even got you know our, our agricultural equipment is controlled by satellite technology as well these yes. massive great machines that go up and down near my back garden with yep. no one in you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh john deere just released that they have a fully autonomous tractor that you can control remotely yeah, not for uh, me. Not near my house. I'm pleased the farmer's sitting in the cab in mine and giving me yeah. a wave. Yeah. So, um... and then and then as we move to um, autonomous vehicles, which is another horror story, and well, it's been a subject of many films in the past, hasn't it? As well. I mean, it's for me quite scary. I spoke to uh, a chap who's got a software company which does GNSS spoofing and jamming scanning, and that kind of conversations with him is what opened my eyes to the, the risks associated with it and how kind of vulnerable a lot of these systems are. And also it's not just an infrastructure vulnerability, it's personal vulnerabilities as well, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so how easy was it during that demonstration? How easy was it to uh, spoof GPS? I think, um, I mean, easy is the answer. Uh, <laughs> Without getting too technical, the data he had, I think he's, a, he's now getting some US data, but the data he had was in um, Russia, which is clearly going to be a little bit more skewed, perhaps, than the rest of the world. because they, they practice there a lot. But that was fairly horrific, Alex, if I'm honest, the amount of yeah. incidents. And it was the amount of untracked, uncatalogued, and basically unaware people were of these things even taking place. And they were... It wasn't that malicious. It was more the fact that they were using their bandwidth or they were accessing their telecoms or, you know, for, for that purpose rather than the information gathering. But it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out what comes next, does it? Yeah, uh, you could definitely use that uh, as an attack. You know, if, if you have a target that you know is using GPS for, for navigation in their car, send them, especially if it's an autonomous car, now all of a sudden it drives off the road. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's easy to escalate this stuff. Uh, I, th I think a <clears throat> big part of the problem with uh, satellite technology is it, they're obscure. You know, they sit, what, 22, 23,000 miles above the Earth's surface in orbit. A lot of people just look at that and go, well, there's, a <clears throat> there's no way you can get yourself out there and do anything to that satellite. But you have to kind of remember you know, look at Bluetooth. Um, when it first came out, it was what, 10 feet effective range, but you could hack it. You could uh, steal data. You could inject data up to about 300 feet away. So wireless technology, it, it's, it might have an effective range, but the absolute range goes on much further. So yeah. whether you're, you're stealing data, whether you're inserting data, um, it, it's, not, it's not exact. It's not a wire that goes from the ground station up. And so if you look at the footprint of a, a downlink on a satellite, it covers a pretty significant portion of the globe. Anybody inside that footprint could potentially inject data or a malicious code. Um, yeah. there, there's a lot that goes into it. You, you have to 
break some code. You have to know how to communicate with satellites. You might have to build a, you know, an amplifier. You're sort of talking about botnets through satellites now and make me really <laughs> nervous, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's there's cross-link communication between satellites as well. So one satellite can use a dish to talk to another one. So now you have a network of satellites out there. Um, now satellites have issues. Um, they end up becoming zombie satellites as they're referred to. There's still satellites that were launched, I believe in the sixties. Yeah. Uh, some of them were from Lincoln labs in the U S that are up there and running around. One or two of them have a, a nuclear power plant on board. Wow. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff that a lot of people don't realize is going on. Outside. You're not making me feel any better, by the way. <laughs> well, I didn't say I would. I said I. Well, you didn't. No, I was just <laughs> hopeful. I was hopeful. It's bad enough that I've, you know, removed my family to an isolated rural location that's off grid without worrying about satellites, especially as I use Starlink for my own communication. <laughs> Maybe I should turn that off and go back to 4G. Well, um, you know. You start thinking about Starlink, uh, China just accused Tesla or uh, SpaceX of getting in the way of their space station and they had to do an emergency maneuver. Oh, so uh, now, you know, there's there's physical issues out in space. There's only so much space in space. <laughs> I know we say it goes on infinite, but... Uh, well, not around our planet, it doesn't. It's becoming like, a, like a junkyard, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, you know... Talking about uh, zombie satellites, as I brought up earlier, there's a graveyard for for satellites once their effective use, <clears throat> excuse me, use is over, their effective life. If they can't be brought down into the atmosphere and burnt up, they're parked into a graveyard. Um, can those be brought back to life? So that's a, a question I've been looking at. I know I'm just painting a bleaker picture, but these are things that need to be answered. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of a positive subject to move on to. Well, if you're interested in space and satellites and cybersecurity, these are things to research and look into, and these are potential jobs. I, th I think it's, for me, it's going to be a massive growth area because you, all I see in the press in the UK at the moment is uh, the potential of drone deliveries for everything, trials going on in Europe, trials going on in the US. I think Ireland already have um, medicines uh, delivered. I think, I'm not sure what part of Ireland. I know trials are going on in different places. Yeah. The risks associated with that are massive. You know, drones I know are easy to hack. I've hacked my own drone when I was practicing <laughs> in the past and it's not difficult. Um, the problem is these big commercial drones can cause a lot of damage and they become a weapon. You're effectively, you can weaponize these objects, can't you? You were saying about the car earlier being crashed. I'm going to stop talking about this now because I'm starting to depress myself. <laughs> let's let's flip it back away from, although I love space, let's flip it back away from okay. space well, satellites. So um, take the positives out of that. You know, you're looking at uh, a potential field for, for cybersecurity jobs, um, whether it's the ground station, the critical infrastructure that supports the ground station and the satellites, or actually, you know, securing the satellites, building them. There's a lot of cybersecurity that would need to, to happen in, in all of those markets. So if it's of interest, you know, maybe that's a way you can break in if you were struggling before. So it's a really good point. Um, before we wrap up, so I'm conscious that we've nearly done 30 minutes of chatting already. It's flown by. Um, <laughs> if if there was one piece of advice you could give someone from the military trying to pivot into cyber, what would it be? Um, <clears throat> I always tell the, uh, the, the veterans and uh, those transitioning out, find a way to translate the, the security knowledge that you learned in the military to cybersecurity. Security is security concepts are the same. So find a way to take what you learned previously and apply that into, you know, a digital domain. Do you, do you see, because I believe that the security industry and the information security industry effectively are going to end up coming together more than they are at the moment, because it's still quite separate here in the UK. Um, there's not many physical security firms that are branched into cyber that I'm aware of. I wondered if you thought that would increase more and more because we always talk about the security first mindset and although it's great securing all your assets you said it earlier what about your gate are the doors secure are the windows locked is everything locked away at not you know it's, it's the basic stuff isn't it and 
the problem I see in, in the industry at the moment is everything segregated. You know, even as much as the IT teams in some businesses are kept away from the cyber teams and someone else is dealing with the phys physical security. And to me, that seems a bit crazy. And the natural progression, I think, could be towards security as a whole rather than just cyber. What do you think? Uh, no, I would agree. Um, so, you know, you often hear um, attack surface. Well, it's yeah. not just a, a computer term, you know, if, no. if your windows are unlocked, if you have a million windows in your building, that's a huge attack surface. You got to go check all those windows, make sure they're locked. It's e easier to climb in one of those and jump on an unlocked workstation than it is to, you know, do a denial of service attack potentially, isn't it? So it all goes hand in hand. Um, you know, if all the security teams work together, we reduce the attack surface, re reduce the vulnerabilities and try and make things more secure. Um, I think it'll work. So how's that going to happen? Who's who's going to do that first, do you think? Um, is it is it going to help more and more as we get more veterans in the industry? Um, or do you think the, the industry is still so young, isn't it, that it's still not really perfectly formed yet? I think if I could answer that question better, I'd probably be worth a lot more money. <laughs> That's why I wanted the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if it's just veterans, but, you know, getting, getting people from various backgrounds, you know, uh, you don't have to be military. You don't have to be finance. You don't have to be medical. You don't have to be IT. Uh, but but getting all of these people that look at uh, problems and, and projects in a different mindset, I think, will help greatly. You'll get I, I spoke. I spoke to an amazing lady earlier, Alex uh, Candace, who I've spoke to a couple of times, helping her with a resume. And I've done a bit of work on it, reworded the front bit because I felt that she needed more in there about her interpersonal skills. I'll get on to the point in a minute. Then we're talking for 20 minutes. And then at the end, we start talking about jigsaw puzzles and how she loves doing puzzles. And she was talking about this passionately for about 10 minutes. So I've now had to go back and tell her we're going to have to review her whole resume because as you rightly said, it's that whole, if she conveys the passion she's got for problem solving and puzzles in her resume, I think it would hit home with the, <laughs> with the recruiters. Yeah, and every day is a puzzle or a problem in cybersecurity. It sure is. <laughs> Alec, this has been an absolute pleasure. Um, any final words before we go? No, um, this has been a great conversation. Um, I, I hope somebody can take something out of this and, and move forward. Um, you know, I hope I'm not just blowing hot air. <laughs> so good luck. Um, find your way. If you need help trying to find your way, you can look us up at Full Cyber Human Initiative and, and we'll do our best to try and get you through you know, the training you need to uh, pivot into cybersecurity. Alex, that's awesome. I'm going to put the link for the whole Cyber Human Initiative in the comments on YouTube. I'll also do a post on LinkedIn to promote it. Um, we need to talk about the apparel and the clothing range next. So perhaps I'll get Paul on next week or the week <laughs> after so we can talk about it for half an hour, Paul, rather than just the five minutes we have today. Everyone, It'll thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for watching the show. If you do like the content, please do like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Make sure you click the alert button to be notified of future content. My name's Simon. I've had an amazing time with Alex. Alex, thank you so much. See you later, everyone. Yeah.